All right, can everyone hear me? Okay. All right, a very good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you about weather this evening. My apologies that due to my schedule, I'm not able to attend meetings on a more regular basis, but it certainly was uh, about a year and a half that I was moved from mornings to evenings and a little tight schedule is now is usually the time that I spend with my wife and seeing her for an hour and a half each day. But I get to spend some time with you this evening. Um, I am Travis, W3TJK, and I'm the Chief Meteorologist here at CBS 19. And I'm going to talk to you about severe weather in Virginia, certainly from a broadcast meteorologist perspective. I know that there are other meteorologists in the house, um, and I'm sure you'll weigh in with a couple of uh, knowledgeable tidbits along the way and enhance my presentation as I go along. So, Tell you a little about my background. I am a graduate of Penn State University. I got my Bachelor of Science degree in meteorology back in 2000. A lot of people say, oh, hey, you got a BS in meteorology. That's convenient. I'll let you decipher that as you will. I've got 21 years of broadcast meteorology experience. I've been uh, here in Charlottesville now for almost 14 years. And before that, I was in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a place that knows a little bit about weather. I was there for about eight years. I am a member of the National Weather Association. Um, I have also served as a consulting meteorologist for two fire departments um, and emergency operations teams, which has been a lot of fun to get involved in the weather outside of the uh, television realm. And I also had the uh, opportunity for a year and a half while I was in Johnstown to uh, be an adjunct instructor at Mount Aloysius College in Crescent, Pennsylvania. I was able to teach a 400 level class for about a year and a half talking largely about uh, what I'll be speaking to you about tonight, although this certainly won't take a semester to do so. I'll just kind of condense it to maybe less than an hour. So people often ask me, Travis, how's the weather? Well, it's a little bit like this, maybe, maybe not. Certainly open for interpretation, but a big deal of what I do is looking at things in the atmosphere and deciding, well, what is it? Is it gonna hurt me? Is it harmless? Upon first glance, this looks like a tornado, but believe it or not, I'm the one that took the photograph and I can tell you with utmost confidence that if you know anything about Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, they have several cooling towers. And what you're seeing here is the steam coming from one of those cooling towers that resembles the shape of a tornado. Now, it of course is a matter of, it looks like one thing, but it's actually not. So that's a big part of my job is looking at things and deciding how harmful they are. Now on a scale of meteorology, it's not just about the big picture. It's not just about the small picture. There are different levels of meteorology in which one can focus. Now, there are scales that deal with weather events that are larger than about a thousand kilometers. That's called synoptic scale. You've got mesoscale events, which happen on the scale of about two to a thousand kilometers. And then even micro scale events that happen on a scale of less than two, th uh, two kilometers, which is about a mile and a half. There's also dynamic meteorology, treating the air around us like it's a fluid and determining what happens when air goes up and down, when it goes uh, undergoes pressure changes and temperature changes. There's also boundary layer meteorology. There's a layer of air just above the Earth's surface. Uh, sometimes it uh, acts like a lid of the atmosphere, kind of caps things, determines whether we get fog or not. So there's all sorts of different branches of meteorology. And likewise, with professions, there are a lot of things you can do as a meteorologist and television is just one of the branches of those trees. Might surprise you to know that more of what I do is based on, based on math than science. Now, these are two meteorological equations that I don't sit and solve every day, but they describe how air moves and what happens to them when they undergo changes in pressure and temperature as they move about in the atmosphere. I would say, in my humble opinion, that meteorology is more about 75% math and about 25% science because to understand the science, you have to understand the math and what happens to air parcels and air in the atmosphere as it gets warmer and colder and as it goes, uh, undergoes pressure changes and just changes at different points of the atmosphere. And that can all be described through mathematics and science. So in theory, you can like science and hate math and be okay at meteorology, or you can like math and hate science and still be a good meteorologist because math is really the big uh, fundamental building block of the field. 
Key ideas to weather is that air is always moving. It's moving up, it's moving down, it's moving sideways. It changes as it moves. It becomes cold, it becomes hot. You throw in some sunshine for warmth. You show in, uh, you introduce some water, which also contains stored energy and you know, acts as precipitation. And that's basically where weather comes from. And I like to think of it as a case where the hotter the hot and the colder the cold, the bigger bang for the buck you have in terms of what kind of nasty weather you're gonna get. And it's funny that Ed should happen to mention a few minutes ago about Oklahoma and his time there, because this evening as I'm looking at radar as we speak, and maybe in a few minutes we'll take a, a live look at radar, if you will. I know I'm sounding like a broadcast. Um, North Texas, Western Oklahoma, Western Kansas, the uh, front range of the Rockies and Colorado are all kind of in a prime area for uh, severe thunderstorms and possibly tornadoes this evening because you've got that clash between very warm, humid air and also uh, very cold, dry air. So that's a prime example of weather as it happens right now with what I'm talking about. So you've probably heard these terms before. Wind chill is nothing more than the combination of the temperature and the speed of wind. And I like to use the coffee analogy. If I have a cup of coffee and I put it on a table, after a while, the coffee is going to cool to room temperature. If I put a fan in front of that cup of coffee, it's going to cool faster. Well, likewise with your body, the faster the wind blows, the faster your body is going to cool off and the colder you will feel. So the wind chill is kind of the quantitative measure of a, a temperature, if you will, as to what it actually feels like to the human body. Now, the windshield does not apply to a building or to any other non-living object, but certainly humans, as we radiate heat, we're going to feel it faster when the winds are blowing colder. It's going to feel colder. In the summertime, we talk about the heat index, higher moisture, higher relative humidity. Your body does not cool off as quickly because the sweat on your skin does not evaporate as quickly when there's already a lot of moisture in the air. So the heat index is a combination of temperature and relative humidity. So again, that applies to humans and living creatures. Lightning is something that is ever commonplace when talking about thunderstorms. And I'm really focusing here on uh, notable weather things that can do harm or put your lives or property at risk. Three kinds of lightning. There's lightning that goes from cloud to ground. There's lightning that goes from one cloud to another cloud. And there's lightning that goes from one part of a cloud to another part of the same cloud. We call that, we call that intra-cloud lightning. Inter-cloud lightning is from one cloud to another. And then cloud to ground is your third type. Lightning is roughly 10 times hotter than the surface of the sun. If you were to try and uh, measure the energy and the heat associated with it, um, average length of a lightning bolt, usually about five to 10 miles, but of course with bigger thunderstorms and more powerful ones, that can vary greatly. And some of, from what I've read, lightning bolts can be in excess of 50 miles or more. Uh, we like to say that if you're basically hearing thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Uh, lightning has a lot of power to it. And if you look at the top three weather killers in the US along with flooding and heat, Lightning is one of the other three in terms of the number of fatalities every year that happen because of weather-related events. Um, weather, uh, lightning is one of those things where, whereas you have events like flooding or heat where uh, people are harmed on a more wider scale or in more numbers, lightning tends to kill one person at a time when it does its damage. Um, thunder is the sound of lightning, which Basically, as lightning travels, it makes the air around it very hot. So the sound of that air expanding is what you hear as thunder. Uh, we often go by the five-second rule, a quick and dirty way of determining how far away a thunderstorm is. Uh, once you hear, or once you see the lightning, start counting, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,004, and so on, and then stop when you hear the thunder. And then take that number and divide by five. And the reason for that is because it takes sound five seconds to travel one mile. If you look at the number of fatalities and thunderstorms per year, uh, Florida has a distinction of being the place where there are the most lightning deaths every year and also the most thunderstorms. I believe recent numbers I've seen, uh, they average about uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 thunderstorms every single year in Florida. And about a quarter of those lightning deaths do happen in open spaces. There are two ways to form thunderstorms. You can do it as a front moves through and lifts air into the atmosphere, or if warm air kind of runs over cooler air. And also just by nature of the sun coming out, what I call the stovetop method, convection. If you liken a pot of water on a stove and then you turn the burner on and the water starts to boil, well, in the same way, the sun comes out, 
warms up the air at the surface, that warm air rises, and if conditions are favorable, it can keep going and build clouds which tower and then produce thunder and lightning. There are three phases of a thunderstorm. There's the convective phase, which is air going up. You have a mature phase, which is air going up and air going down. So you have updrafts and downdrafts. And you've also got the dissipation phase where basically the death of a thunderstorm is when all the air just kind of collapses out of it. And sometimes it can do so quite forcefully to the point where you can have wind damage or damage related events. And I'll talk about that in just a few. Here's a good graphic that just kind of describes everything that's happening. You've got air going up. You've got air going up and down in the mature stage. And then when it dissipates, the air just kind of is out of moisture or it changes temperature and the conditions are no longer favorable. So the air just kind of falls out of a thunderstorm. Thunderstorms can produce many things. You've got thunder and lightning. You've got very heavy rain. You've got damaging wind potential, um, not related to tornadoes, which again, kind of the same lines I'll talk about in a few minutes. You can also produce very large hail and also you've got the potential for either short-lived or long-lived tornadoes, depending on the ingredients in the atmosphere. Thunderstorms can take the shape of squall lines, which is a line of thunderstorms, say along a cold front. You also have bow echoes, which are bent lines of thunderstorms. And as we found out on June 29th, 2012, you can also have derechios, which is basically a long, it's a straight line wind damage associated with any thunderstorm. And there are criteria in determining whether something is actually the ratio. Maybe we'll touch on that if we have a little time later on. Uh, that time being now. This is a radar composite of the derecho that affected Central Virginia and much of the Ohio Valley in the Midwest uh, back on June 29th, 2012. And one of the criteria, and while it's ever changing and open for discussion, in essence, one of the criteria for a gusty line of thunderstorms to be classified to ratio is if it does widespread wind damage over a stretch of at least 250 miles. So basically you look at the first damage reports and the last ones, and once you get to about 240, 250 miles, that's when it can be classified as a ratio. And you see in the squares here, I don't know if my little mouse pointer is showing up, but you've got um, these are all wind gusts that were reported. You've got 81 miles per hour, which I believe was around Columbus or Chillicothe, Ohio. Covington, Virginia actually recorded a 90 mile an hour wind gust from the derecho before it lost power. Um, I also remember too, uh, I don't know what any of you are doing, but I remember I was sitting at my kitchen table that night and I very much remember the wind going from nothing to holy cow in about five seconds. And it really was a very quick onset of gusty winds that ended up doing some damage to trees on our property. So I know as a meteorologist and, you know, on a personal level, it certainly is something that I remember very well. So with thunderstorms, I mentioned about the different phases, about air going up, air going down. But what happens sometimes in the case of derechios, kind of an explainer here of what I just said, you've got air that happens to collapse out of a thunderstorm. And when it does so, the air hits the ground and it just kind of bulges outward. So a lot of times you feel the gusts of winds before you actually uh, feel the rain from a thunderstorm or an advancing line of showers or whatnot. Well, that's that air coming out of the thunderstorm, uh, might even call it a gust front. The outflow is another term that we call. And that air moving out ahead of it or behind the thunderstorm can also produce more thunderstorms in its wake. Uh, case in point, the Johnstown floods in Pennsylvania in 1889 and 1977, you had one thunderstorm develop, it moved out of the way, but the air coming out of it was actually enough to create another thunderstorm roughly in the same place. So that thunderstorm then rolled across the same place, fizzled out, produced another thunderstorm, and that training, if you will, the one storm after another, is how they end up with 12 inches of rain in less than 11 hours. In fact, Ivy, um, a couple of years ago, uh, back I think it was May 30th, I had the date here in a slide upcoming, uh, back in Ivy, Virginia, a few years ago when we got, I think, 11 inches of rain in four hours. That was the same deal. You had one thunderstorm develop, moving away, generated another thunderstorm in the same place. So Ivy just kept getting these thunderstorms one after the other right overhead that brought all this rain in a very short period of time, which led to some really devastating flooding. And I believe there were a couple of fatalities involved with that. Other things associated with thunderstorms, hail, and I have a little explainer here if you're not the, the uh, word type of fan. And basically what happens is in hail, 
Raindrops get blown up into a thunderstorm they, from updrafts. They collide with other raindrops and become bigger water droplets. And then as they get colder, they freeze. And then when they become heavy enough, they fall into little hailstones. And sometimes they keep getting blown back up, growing and then falling and growing and falling. So you can get very small hail like shown here in this picture, or you can happen to get very large one, uh, large hail, which I'll show you in a minute. So kind of showing you a visualization, water droplets go up, turns into ice, collides with other ice and water, and basically falls as a big chunk of ice or a small chunk of ice. Largest hailstone ever recorded. There's a picture of it, July 23rd, 2010. This was in Vivian, South Dakota. If you measure it from one end to the other, it is eight inches in diameter. And I believe earlier this year, Texas measured its biggest hailstone ever, which I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, was about six and a half inches in diameter. The largest hailstone ever recorded in Virginia, while there's no official record, from what I was able to find, was back on April 27th, uh, 2011 in southwestern Virginia. Um, four and a half inches in diameter, I believe, is the, uh, the biggest hailstone recorded in Virginia. So when you're talking about hail, you're also talking about another facet of meteorology where, okay, if you're out in the plains, storms that produce tornadoes may not be as big a concern as maybe hail producing storms that can harm livestock and have no open shelter. So that's something else, another part of meteorology that, hey, thunderstorms, tornadoes may not be a threat, but obviously with hail, it can be a big threat too. Um, as one of my old meteorology instructors said, good time to buy a car for dirt cheap, brand new car is right after a hailstorm because if they're a little dings and dents, I mean, granted, they'll probably write it off to insurance, but they can't sell the cars as new anymore. So even a car dealer has got to be worried about things like this. Supercell, probably hear that term tossed around quite a bit. That's nothing more than a thunderstorm that spins. You can have updrafts going excess of 150 miles per hour. You can have long-lived supercells, and the supercells are kind of the next phase in storms that happen to produce tornadoes. So just kind of showing you here, You've got air that happens to spin, the whole thing spins around and that can lead to areas of rotation, which can then produce tornadoes. I think I jumped over a graphic there. Tornadoes can be long and skinny. They can be short and wide. There can be several vortices with one cloud of a th of thunderstorm, uh, multiple vortex tornadoes. And uh, there's a special on Netflix a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago that came out about Theodore Fujita. Um, he ended up being an instructor at Penn State. He did extensive research back in the 60s and 70s about tornadoes. Um, and if you ever come across that, I'll try and find the name before the end of the meeting, uh, the presentation, but it is an outstanding watch and will give you a very good indication of um, the knowledge that he obtained and understanding the methodology and the nature of tornadoes, which to an extent, we only know so much and are continuing to learn about them. Uh, theories about how they're formed, you know, rolls of air that just kind of, you know, spin around and they spin so fast they stand up. You've got, you know, wind that just kind of goes around like this and almost like putting a block of clay in your hand and rubbing it out in a little tube. You know, the atmosphere rolls the air around and spins things around. So there are many methods as to how tornadoes can form. One of the things, and I know this is gonna be up uh, Ed's wheelhouse, is how do we detect tornadoes on radar? Well, this is an image from back in 2008. Uh, this was shortly after I got here. I was only here for about five months at the time. But what we do is we look, one of the things we look for is we happen to look for these little hooks, these little, <coughs> excuse me, commas, if you will, because what's happening here is you've got a thunderstorm, the purple indicating you know, very intense rainfall or even hail, and the red and the yellow and it kind of tapers off with the color. What's happening here is these little hooks or these commas, they tend to be areas where the wind is kind of blowing them around. So if the wind is blowing the precipitation, there's an indication that, hey, maybe this thunderstorm is a supercell and then it could produce a tornado with little or no warning. And in this case, this thunderstorm did produce a weak tornado outside Fredericksburg, but thankfully uh, damage was minimal and nobody was killed. So those are things that we look for and I'll show you even more. Now, this is an image from 2003. This is one of the stronger tornadoes that happened to affect Oklahoma City uh, during one of their outbreaks in the last 30 years or so. 
If you see this little red dot right in the center, this is basically a Fibonacci sequence, a Fibonacci swirl, if you will. But that circle right in the middle, that little dot, that is a tornado. And I think at the time this was an EF2 tornado or, or just an F2 tornado. But that is a tornado being detected on radar by this radar. So if we see something like that, we got ourselves a really big problem. And uh, certainly a lot of people need to be warned and could be affected by something like that. All right. More recently, let's flash back to August 31st and September 1st. That, for uh, many of you might recall, was the night that the remnants of Hurricane Ida moved through the Mid-Atlantic. We were on the outer fringe, and we happened to have a number of tornado warnings that put us on the air nonstop from 10.30 uh, Tuesday nights into about 1 o'clock on Wednesday morning. And this is one of the programs I use, which I have on my computer, and this shows several different things. Now, in this image in the upper left, there is no distinct hook by any means. But over here on the right, this is what we call velocity signature. The radar, to give you a sense of placement. So right here is Charlottesville. You're looking in Southern Albemarle County. Here's Covesville, Esmont, Scottsville. So the radar that we're using in this case is out of Blacksburg, which is going to be the lower left of your screen. So everywhere it's red, is air traveling away from the radar. Everywhere it's green, it's traveling toward. So basically you have this area of green with an area of red all in a very short distance. So again, you take air, you just kind of imagine it's doing this and rolling. Well, if this is indicated on radar, the National Weather Service will issue a tornado warning. And sure enough, there in red, in the upper center of your screen is a tornado warning that was issued, the first of which uh, several that were issued for Albemarle County, and this one went until 1130. Down here in the lower right, you've also got parameters for uh, hail detection. And I do believe that there was small hail reported with this thunderstorm. And this is the one that I think was later warned for the city of Charlottesville. It kind of tracked to the northeast, and there was later a warning for uh, central Albemarle County and Charlottesville that was issued. So this is something I used real time that night, um, even before the warning was issued to say, hey, here's an area of strong rotation. Hey, here's a thunderstorm that looks to be, you know, maybe hooking a little bit. This could be a problem. And sure enough, a few minutes later, that warning was issued and we were on the air. Between 1950 and 1997, if you look at the 12 months of the year, May statistically was the month with the most tornadoes and fatalities. And the reason why the data stops at 1997 is because I did that research a few years ago and I have not had time to update it. However, spring and fall tend to be the more likely times for severe weather because spring and fall are transition seasons. In the spring, you're getting out of the cold of winter and you're getting into the warm of summer. And likewise with fall right now, you're getting out of the warmth of summer and into the cooler months of winter. So you have the cold air and the warm air that can help fuel these storms and these supercells that produce tornadoes. Fujita scale, we are talking about Ted Fujita a couple of minutes ago. It is a damage-based scale. Uh, back in the day, uh, before 2007, it was ranked from F0 to F5. And now it's EF0 to EF5 because on February 1st, 2007, the enhanced Fujita uh, scale came about. The reason that was adjusted is because due to structures and building codes and whatnot, it doesn't take as much wind nowadays to do extensive damage to buildings. So I don't want to use the term dumbed down a bit for a scale, but the scale was shifted given the change in structures. Um, in other words, they just don't build them like they used to. Other things I talk about in terms of extreme weather, this is the Susquehanna River outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is roughly where I am from. Uh, we talk about flooding. We talk about droughts. In fact, we were in uh, moderate drought conditions here for a chunk of the area uh, for much of the summer as it was a fairly dry summer overall. But now we've at least gotten the water table back up to a respectable level. Of course, one of the big floods that happens, the deadliest in American history was the Johnstown flood, the first one, which happened the May 31st 1889, um, downtown Johnstown was pretty much wiped out. I mentioned Ivy, Virginia. This was May 30th, 2018. This is an aerial view of Ivy. This is when they happened to pick up about 11 inches of rain in the span of about four hours. And this is the end result. 
Hurricanes and tropical cyclones, we are no stranger to those either. This is a satellite picture of Hurricane Katrina back in 2005 before it made landfall just east of um, uh, New Orleans. When talking about hurricanes, storm motion really is everything. So in this case, for reference, it's always the northeastern quadrant of the storm that happens to be uh, packing the gustiest winds, or at least the northeastern quadrant with respect to the storm motion. So if the winds inside the storm are 90 miles per hour, well, on this side of the storm, you add the 90 plus the 10, you've actually got winds of 100 miles per hour. But on the other side of the storm, you've got forward motion of 90 miles per hour, uh, sorry, opposite motion winds of 90 miles per hour and storm motion of 10 miles per hour. So your winds are actually a little bit lower on the left side of the hurricane. Still, 80 mile per hour winds are gonna do a lot of damage. The practice of naming hurricanes started in 1953. Uh, Alternating of women's and men's names happened in 1978. There is an international list of names repeated every seven years. And if there is a storm that's incredibly costly or destructive, that name is then retired and it is replaced on the list. So as far as hurricanes affecting Virginia, uh, keeping in mind, I was born in the late 70s. So a lot of these more potent ones like Connie and Hazel, certainly Camille was another ones. Uh, they were well before my time. I do remember not remember, but I uh, do uh, take particular note of Hurricane Agnes in 1972, because a lot of the rainfall records in Pennsylvania, where I am from, uh, the longstanding records of flooding and rainfall totals came from Hurricane Agnes in 1972. Some of the more notable storms, Hurricane Fran, uh, the maximum rainfall from this storm was 16 inches, which was measured at Big Meadows up on uh, Shenandoah National Park on Skyline Drive. Uh, that was in 1996, and that was right as I was starting my freshman year at Penn State. So I remember that very much because there was also quite a bit of severe weather in Southern Maryland, Delaware, as well as the Susquehanna Valley of Pennsylvania. Uh, another storm to affect Virginia was Hurricane Floyd. Maximum rainfall, and that was a little over two feet um, in Southport, North Carolina, which is just along the coast. I believe that's outside of Wilmington, almost near us, uh, kind of between Wilmington and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Also had a big impact, mainly in the eastern half of Virginia. Hurricane Isabel was 2003. I remember this one because my sister lived in Newport News and had to be evacuated. Uh, the track of this pretty much came inland and you had your bullseye of rain right around Sharando in excess of 20 inches and a lot of flooding and damage. This picture on the left just happens to be from um, Tidewater and Hampton Roads from a lot of the rain. That Hurricane Isabel, uh, over half of the counties in Virginia were declared uh, disaster areas from Hurricane Isabel because of all the rain and the flooding. And that does include pretty much everyone in Central Virginia. I think it says here 79 of the 123 counties were uh, declared disaster areas. I mentioned earlier about Hurricane Ida. Uh, these are some pretty eye-opening numbers. And this only happened about a month, five, six weeks ago. Um, September 2nd, the rainfall from Ida, which basically just sat over Long Island in downtown Manhattan. I mean, you had Newark, New Jersey, absolutely obliterate its daily rainfall record of nearly eight and a half inches. I believe the previous record was about five for one day, it's single day rainfall record. You also had records at LaGuardia, um, Bridgeport, Connecticut got almost six inches of rain. That was the third wettest and even Central Park, uh, seven point one nine I think seven point two inches roughly that was its fifth wettest day on record as well so sometimes you don't have to necessarily have tornadoes or wind damage to have large impact weather events but all these things are things that I keep watch on and try and forecast and you know keeping everyone ahead of these types of events Hurricane Sandy was a notable event for a couple of reasons not just because of where it ended up making landfall but also because this was one case where you ended up with 12 inches of rain in Bellevue, Maryland, which is out almost in the Delmarva Peninsula. But at the same time, it was cold enough on the western side of the storm that you ended up with over 30 inches of snow in Wise, Virginia. In fact, there are a lot of pictures from UVA Wise of them just absolutely buried in snow as a result of Hurricane Sandy and parts of the Great Smokies ended up with three feet of snow from the same exact storm that brought all the rain 
to much of Maryland and Delaware and uh, New Jersey. So sometimes it's not necessarily about the rain that is a concern with uh, remnants of hurricanes or tropical storms. And of course, the heavy hitter in this area, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Hurricane Camille. Certainly when you talk to people in this area about, you know, when someone says hurricanes in Central Virginia, what comes to mind? It happens to be Camille. I mean, these pictures just speak for themselves. Um, that's the Thai River Bridge. And believe it or not, railroad signals, they were still activated and giving trains the clear signal because the rails were not broken. Had these rails been broken with the uh, bridge going out, then the trains would have been stopped. But believe it or not, people, there was a story, if you believe, um, uh, the roar of the heavens, where an individual basically drove after a train to get them to stop because the tracks weren't broken, but the signal still said that there weren't any problems. So that's why I had that picture there is uh, just kind of a reminder that, yeah, there were a lot of people that certainly saved a lot of lives at night. The Camille affected Nelson County. Unfortunately, a lot of lives were still lost. So what happened? You had a lot of ingredients in place, the stalled cold front, that was your boundary, your focal point for everything. You had a lot of moisture off of the ocean at different levels of the atmosphere. And you also had a lot of air in the upper levels that helped bring the air up, which just led to 24, 25 inches of rain across parts of Nelson County. So you could call it a perfect storm, but in more practical terms, it was a case of everything just coming together at the right place at the right time. Uh, you've got your bullseyes for precipitation here. As far as uh, you know, maximums, 25 inches, 20 inches across a lot of Nelson County. Wintertime events, snow and ice, being a Pennsylvania native, no stranger to them. Uh, you've probably heard about the difference between sleet and freezing rain before. Sleet is rain that freezes before it hits the ground. Freezing rain is rain that's so cold that it freezes once it hits an object like a car or the pavement or sidewalk or a railing. So in terms of getting your accumulations of ice like you have on the tree branches here, that's because of freezing rain. So in terms of potential danger, freezing rain is far more concerning than sleet. Uh, sleet's almost like driving on sand. It's still slippery, still concerning. The freezing rain is what turns everything into a sheet of ice. And that's definitely uh, something that is just the, of paramount concern when it comes to wintertime weather, which speaking of, some numbers about Charlottesville winters. Our average snow per season, anywhere from about 16 to 21 inches. If you go to the Blue Ridge Mountains, that basically doubles. So you talk to Blue Ridge Parkway, Skyline Drive, Wintergreen, Afton, their average is more of about 20 to 50 inches of snow per winter. Snowiest winter ever happened to be the 2009-2010. We got nearly 57 inches of snow. Um, earliest measurable snow in this area happened to be October 10th. Uh, 1979. And the reason that's notable is because that was also the first game of the World Series between the Pirates and the Orioles in Baltimore. And there was actually snow flying at Memorial Stadium. So that home game was affected by snow falling. And our friend Thomas Jefferson, he happened to record a large storm of three feet of snow back in 1772. As we know, he was a very diligent record keeper. Other notable storms, not just for Virginia, but also the so a personal professional note, blizzard of 96, you had over three feet of snow that basically closed schools for about three weeks. Up here, right in the center where it says 38, little white dot in Pennsylvania, that is where I'm from. I'm from York, Pennsylvania. So we uh, were among the heavy hitters when it came to snowfall totals. Um, around Pendleton, Pocahontas, Greenbrier counties in West Virginia, I mean, you had anywhere from two to eight, uh, two to four feet of snow in those elevations as well. Uh, some local pictures, one of my friends that shoots railroad photography with me. Uh, this is the Kemper Street Station, the Amtrak Station in Lynchburg. Everything's just absolutely buried in snow. I mentioned about 2009, 2010 being one of the snowier winters on record. Well, this was the first of those storms. And this is a great case, too, of it's not necessarily how much snow you get, but it's when you happen to get it. This was pegged to be a Saturday, Sunday storm is from a forecasting standpoint. We thought it was going to start Friday night. Well, of course, this was the weekend before Christmas. So, of course, everyone traveling on Friday and Saturday, getting out of town for the holiday. Well, we didn't think the snow would start until well after sunset. Well, it turns out that the snow started around four o'clock on Friday afternoon. By five o'clock that Friday afternoon, there were already 
two inches of snow on the ground. And then it really got heavy and heavy and just kept on going to the point where roads pretty much became impassable. People's cars were straight. Like they just abandoned their cars because they were snowed on the interstate. They could not move about right at rush hour. So again, that's why I say it's not necessarily how much snow you get, which we ended up anywhere from third, uh, 18 to 30 inches across the area. But a lot of it too about being a meteorologist is forecasting when these things are going to happen. And even now, 12 inches of snow may not be a bit as big a deal on a weekend, but maybe one or two inches of snow at Friday at 5 p.m. that can make the roads very slippery when everyone's out and about. That could be actually more concerning than 12 inches of snow on some random Saturday in February. National Weather Service is in the process of updating their wording and um, modifying their watches, warnings, and advisories. But as it stands now, if a warning is issued, it means something is occurring or it is imminent. Watch just means there's potential. The ingredients are there. Maybe it happens. Maybe it won't happen. And advisories, uh, like winter weather advisories, those are reserved for events that aren't life-threatening, but they're just more inconvenient. And they could certainly make for hazardous travel or minor inconveniences or slight problems. Wind advisories are something else that you probably hear in terms of an advisory. So just some thank yous for my sources here. I use a lot of them. Um, questions, hey, it is a real place. National Weather Service does take observations from Hell, Michigan. It is there. It's actually a pretty nice town too. They have a good ice cream shop. Um, and I did promise you here, let me pull up the radar. Um, kind of a real time thing. And Ed, feel free to unmute yourself and even weigh in with your expertise here because you're doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, I showed you this earlier. This is the program that I used to kind of decipher tornadoes when it came to our remnants of um, Hurricane Ida. But yeah, right Travis, now- we're not, we're just seeing the PowerPoint still. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can- You, you may need to unshare and reshare to get it to go. Okay, let me try that. Uh, share screen. Yep. Yes. Okay. And again, Ed, feel free to chime in, but this is real time right now. So we happen to be uh, a little bit west of Oklahoma City. So here in the upper left, you got what certainly appears to be a supercell, little bit of a hook on here. Um, here's a really good example as well. I mentioned how green is going towards the radar and red is going away. I believe this radar is going to be out of Frederick, Oklahoma, which is a little farther south. So in this case, you have air going this way and air going this way. So you definitely have some very strong rotation. Down here in the lower right, uh, this red kind of puts it in the larger hail category. And these little triangles just kind of give more information about uh, different things that the radar is picking up. So again, like, these are the things that I looked at with Hurricane Ida. These are the things that we meteorologists look at real time to determine whether these things are concerning, whether there's a problem and where they're going and what they're doing. And certainly uh, conditions very favorable right now in this part of the country for uh, supercells and for tornadoes. I just wanna add in the 21 years I lived in Norman, Oklahoma, my roof, had to be replaced three times due to hail. And it, you could have a large hail, five inches in diameter, and it might be soft and squishy, mm -hmm. and nickel size hail could be more damaging. But one time we had large, hard hail, about four inches, and it literally punched a hole through the plywood in my roof beneath the shingles. And at least five times we had hail where it damaged 100% of the screens and broke about 10 large windows in our house. Mm -hmm. so, um, a couple of nights ago, outside Oklahoma City and uh, around Tulsa, they had those uh, hail storms as well. And Hannah Scholl's uh, fiance's friend had you know, both the front and rear windshield of her car totally just blasted out because of the hail falling. So it's, yeah, hail composition is something to take note of as well, but yeah, it's often, I don't want to say it's a joke, a ha-ha funny joke, but that corridor, um, Interstate 44 between Oklahoma City and Tulsa is regarded as one of the more dangerous weather corridors because so many hail-producing storms and tornadic storms happen in this area. And there was instances, one time when I was living there, when an infant outside with his mother was 
hit by hail and died of a brain mm -hmm. injuries. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah, I mentioned earlier about um, livestock being affected by this. I mean, if you've got three, four inch diameter hail falling out in the middle of the field and, you know, animals have no shelter, I'll let you uh, finish, uh, finish the thought. But yeah, just to give you an indication here, it's a tornado warning, uh, radar indicated rotation, which is the same thing we're seeing right here. That's a pretty impressive little couplet too. So yeah, I would not be surprised there around beautiful downtown Retrop, Oklahoma. Tracking to the, uh, where's it going? North at 20 miles per hour. Also, I did some volunteer work for FEMA in May, 2013 in Moore, Oklahoma, which was about three miles north of my house. And the damage after the tornado, and this particular tornado killed about 20 school children because most tornadoes seem to happen in the evening when people are home and this storm took place during the day and the school did not have a proper storm shelter. So children were killed, some drowned when this elementary school collapsed. Mm -hmm. But the damage in person walking looked far worse than what you see on CNN or Fox News or the Weather Channel. I, I do have a question for you. Yes. Because my background is more the engineering side, but I do understand a lot of the meteorology. Why do these tornadoes tend to happen more at night, or is that a myth? Very good question. Actually, it's not really a myth. There's kind of a, a truth to it. What happens meteorologically is, okay, as, let's see if I can, how do I explain this? All right, so during the course of the day, warm air rises. Now, there is a point in the atmosphere a lot of times where we have what's called a cap or a lid in the atmosphere, a point where, uh, like the air normally gets colder as you go up, but there can be points in the atmosphere where the air actually gets warmer with height. So that little sliver of air, thin or thick, that layer is called what we call a boundary layer or a cap. What happens is for thunderstorms and supercells and tornadoes to form, those thunderstorms, they have to basically break through the cap to go high enough to where it's cold enough that you can get you know, such a powerful storm to develop. Well, what happens is once you get in the later afternoon, evening hours, that cap, that resistance, that lid on the jar, if you will, it starts to weaken. So it gets easier for that warmer air to poke through it. And then once it's through that, it just keeps going up to the point where you get these massive supercells to develop. So oftentimes what we see, and this is a great example, you still got air in the later part of the day, another two hours behind us, uh, so 543. But this is a time of day where, okay, the air has just been poking up at that, that layer enough that finally it's either poked through or that layer started to weaken. And now the air has no resistance and just keeps going up and up and away, making these supercells. So yes, that's a very, very good question, but it's actually not a myth. Now, that's not to say you can't get, you know, tornadoes at two in the morning or three in the morning or in, in the morning, but certainly, I mean, in this case, as we're looking here in Oklahoma, they've had a whole day of sunshine, a whole day of heating, and this air has been going up and up and up. And now that that layer is starting to weaken, well, guess what? It's almost like unscrewing a little in a jar, lids off, air is going up, and you got yourself some supercells as we are literally seeing right here on radar in front of us. Does anyone in the group remember the toilet that hit Ivy and uh, Mitchum's River and Crozet back in, uh, I think, about 1959? I certainly don't remember it, but I've, I just, it just came up uh, in conversation with a friend a few months ago, uh, September 30th is uh, when that happened. So that was also a somewhat late season. Uh, that one was, uh, it was an F3 tornado. Basically it was on the ground for about a mile. It was about 200 yards wide and there were 11 fatalities and four injuries. Yeah, it killed one house. And two people in another house mm -hmm. in a church uh, next to Mitchell's River. It took the back of the church off down to up to the pulpit, and the Bible was open on the on the uh, stadium uh, post them. And it, uh, the preacher said that the Bible was open, and it didn't even turn a page of the Bible, but the whole back of the church was 
gone forever. I mean, I went out and I also went and saw the house in uh, Mitchell's River that the nine people were killed in. Mm -hmm. Then it went to the top of my house and I was laying in bed. I was sick and I couldn't even get out of bed, but I heard it sounded like it's just a freight train. But the only damage it did in my home was some limbs out of the top of the trees. It lifted up quite a bit by that time. Mm -hmm. We're also fortunate Travis. in this area. In Oklahoma, for the most part, homes do not have basements. Very few people have storm shelters. So here, at least we have a basement to take shelter in. Mm -hmm. Travis, uh, yes. thank you for an excellent presentation. Sure. When we sometimes see these spaghetti plots of hurricane tracks predicted, are some more reliable than others? I keep hearing about the European model. That's a very good question. And it really, it comes down to how, um, how far in advance you wanna look. Spaghetti, uh, for those just kind of recapping your spaghetti plots are, well, let's see if I can even find one before I share my screen. Um, spaghetti plots are basically maps of all the forecasted paths of a hurricane as it travels. And they can go anywhere from, I think, 12 hours out to 168 hours out. And of course, it's almost like forecasting long range. It's a lot like throwing darts at a dartboard. If I'm really close to the dartboard, I have a pretty good chance to hit the bullseye. With the more steps back I take from the dartboard, the harder it is to hit uh, a bullseye. So that's kind of a lot of how the spaghetti plots work. Now, one thing we look for in meteorology is called consensus. When a lot of these computer models tend to make the same prediction, the same general area and the same general trend, then we kind of have a good idea that, hey, maybe this is actually what's going to happen with the weather at a certain period of time. Uh, certainly the European model has gotten a lot of notoriety because it was the only forecast model that accurately and for a long duration too, predicted the path of Hurricane Sandy, which affected much of the mid-Atlantic with the rain and snow. Um, the European model is also one where the, meteorolo uh, the meteorological organization in Europe that runs it, it is not a free model. So they charge clients for it, but the money then goes into your research and development. Um, the American model that we use called the GFS there was just some uh, adjustments made to it, I believe, a couple of months ago, and that is ever improving. As of my personal and professional, I should say my professional experience, I tend not to believe one model more than the other. But what I kind of try and do with models is look at how they do in certain situations in the past. And I also kind of go with consensus. And I also tend to ride the hot hand. Um, if one model seems to do well over a particular course of a hurricane season, maybe that's one that I'm going to pay a little more attention to. But again, that said, models, the technical name is model guidance. They're not used as to make a direct forecast, but just kind of guide someone as a forecaster into what could probably happen 12, 24, 168 hours into the future. So yes, the Euro is one of them. Um, it hasn't, it actually has not been doing very well at all this hurricane season. So, um, there are constantly things that are going to revising that and many other models. Uh, so it's just another thing to kind of keep tabs on is, okay, which one's doing well, which one's not, uh, which one does well in these situations. So it's, that's why I really don't tend to put my stock into one forecasting model and make any kind of a forecast, let alone, um, tropical, uh, forecasts. Thank you. Sure. In fact, let me just share this screen because I have it up now. Um, share screen. This is what I want. So there is now a tropical storm in the uh, Pacific Ocean. This is Pamela. So this is basically what a spaghetti plot looks like. All these different colored lines on these letters are the different models that are making their prediction as far as where it's going to go. So if I look at something like this as a meteorologist and I say, okay, they're all pretty good agreement that they're going to move through northern Mexico. Probably, I believe that's, uh, I don't want to say Laredo, uh, Ciudad Juarez, um, central Texas, and the remnants go right up through southeastern Oklahoma. 
I tend to think as a forecaster, all right, this is a pretty good gauge since everyone's kind of on board and making a similar prediction. My confidence is pretty high that this is where I'm thinking this, the storm and the remnants are actually going to go. Of course, it isn't always as easy. Sometimes you've got things that are just branching left and right. Atlantic storms are like that too. You've just got you know, plots all over the place. So that's why spaghetti models are good for guidance, but they're not to be used as an actual forecast. Uh, Travis, I'll, I'll ask you ask you one. Uh, I was uh, surprised to hear from uh, from one of our members who shall remain nameless, except to say that it was uh, KO8V. Uh, <laughs> I was surprised to hear from him that uh, that the sort of the guidance in in Texas and Oklahoma these days is not to go into underground shelters because they kept having too many people drowned there, and so now the shelters are are sort of above ground. I've and actually, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead and finish. No, well, I'm just, well, just gonna ask you the impossible question of when the next tornado warning call, goes off, where do I go? <laughs> I'm, I'm still gonna say the lowest level of your house or um, would be at a basement or a cellar. I mean, that's why I told everyone on air back on the you know, um, September 1st, just because the lower you are, the better. Now, one thing that is, in my opinion, not stated enough, especially if you're outside away from structures, the rule of thumb is to find a ditch or a low-lying area and lie down or make yourself as low as possible. But the thing to add to that, in my opinion, as well as even being in a lower, uh, a below ground area, is watch out for water and for flooding rains because usually when you have supercells and tornadic uh, thunderstorms, they produce such volumes of rain that they can produce localized flash flooding. So I can understand where that's coming from, but still 99 times out of 100, if I have a tornado warning for my house and you know I'm not at work, I'm gonna be in my basement. <laughs> Travis, Travis. John? Yes. John. My home was built about 1991, and it had one of the two master bedroom closets made out of concrete block with lots of rebar bar, and a steel roof covered with concrete and rebar and a door, of, a steel door about four inches thick, and with sheetrock and painted, it looked like a normal room. And there's no doubt when I was retiring, my house sold like within days and it was a lousy real estate market because it had an above ground shelter. Now I'll also let, I'll let, let Larry get in there, but Joe's out there if he wants to defend himself, if I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, what I'll say is um, after the tornado that came through uh, the area that I lived in back in 2015, we had an EF4 come through um, the National Weather Service, uh, of course, every year does their storm spotting school. And storm, of, of course, these shelters became quite popular. And the guidance uh, from the National Weather Service, as well as others in the area, were to try and move away from the underground storm shelters that had been put in previously uh, for several reasons. One was drowning, one was uh, actually getting trapped in them due to debris. And with the majority of the homes in that area being slab foundations uh, that are above ground, I mean, they're, they're not, we don't have much in the way of basements there. The guidance was to move to a above ground uh, shelter that basically what they do is they come in, they drop it into your garage or a place like that and bolt it down. And that was, uh, they, sold like hotcakes after that EF4 came through. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the same in Oklahoma, Joe, but also I know someone who survived the more Oklahoma by hiding in a bathtub, which was in a corner. Bathtub, bathrooms tend to be stronger rooms structurally, mm -hmm. so with a mattress over them. Yeah, we had several like that in the Garland area and uh, Rowlett that that's where they escaped to. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, that was, that was one that occurred. Uh, it came through, uh, close to 1 AM. So it was very early in the morning. Uh, the national weather service there d elected not to, um, activate storm spotters for, for their safety, because at night you really can't see these things. 
uh, they can be very tough to see. And that's why they elected not to activate their storm spotters. Uh, usually if it's during the day, during light hours, they don't have any issue with activating storm spotters there. But yeah, that was, um, that's when we started seeing, like I said, a lot of these above ground uh, shelters that come in, drop in, bolt in, and you know, it's a couple hour job, that's it. Mm -hmm. Travis? Yes. Okay, the radars, act, until some recent enhancements to the radar algorithms, often a tornado, unless there was report or the radar reflectivity was picking up debris from the tornado, often the radar could not, because of the earth's curvature and the beam bending and all that, often the radar could not see the tornado touching the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a subject that Travis is yeah, in fact, passionate about. It's, it's funny you mentioned that too, Ed, because as I'm looking here, um, the one panel I did not talk about on this radar, if you still have the, uh, the four panel visible, this is now a, a tornado warning for Phillips County in Colorado. See, this is so fun when I get to give a presentation. There's actually stuff to talk about. I, I love doing this. This lower left panel, the CC is called correlation coefficient. And what this does is it's the radar, the dual pole radar, uh, analyzing what is actually in the atmosphere right now. And this, in a nutshell, this is basically how we can determine if there is debris or if there's a tornado because the debris that a tornado will spin up will actually show up here um, on these correlation coefficient maps. Now, it's also hard to say because of where the radar beam is and if it gets intercepted by hail or hits something else. So it's not a, a, a fail safe, but there are certainly times when that proves valuable. Uh, if you also see here, by the way, um, on the lower right panel, this blob in yellow, this uh, hydrometeor classification basically says that very large hail is happening with this uh, tornado worn storm now in Eastern Colorado. Uh, we've got the rotation, we've got heavy rain, but uh, yeah, as far as uh, picking up the debris, all radars couldn't do that, but now the dual pole radars, which kind of scan horizontally and vertically, they can actually detect and pick up what debris is flying around um, in certain events. If you Google search uh, correlation coefficient tornadoes, you'll find a lot of examples of where you can actually see, sometimes you'll even hear if you watch uh, coverage of um, tornadoes and bigger TV stations, we'll talk about a debris ball, um, just like a little clump anomaly here on the uh, correlation coefficient. Well, that's what they're talking about is the radar actually picking up the debris associated with the active tornado. Can I uh, get a question yeah. in? Yeah, you can, go yeah, ahead. Larry. Uh, I used to live in Florida when I grew up and uh, no sellers are basically the, the rule in Florida. And because if you dig five feet down, you hit water. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why I know sellers. And uh, the danger it seemed like uh, to us that was uh, because of code, they seem to build the houses more strongly for uh, against hurricanes than they do tornadoes. And the question was in terms of what do you do when a tornado came through? That seemed to be the greatest fear of people in uh, around Orlando in particular that have a tornado in the area versus a hurricane. Uh, but yet, of course, the water damage from a lot of rain from hurricanes uh, would certainly cause trouble too. But again, it, with no seller, that's a question earlier that we went through. Uh, what do you do? And uh, people just basically uh, were worried that uh, in a tornado, the change in pressure, you might want to talk about pressure uh, having an effect. Everyone would button up their, their houses and then you'd have literally houses explode uh, because of the change in the pressure mm -hmm. as a tornado went through the area. So that was my comment. Interestingly enough, I know there's been a bunch of research in recent years done on that. And um, what I've been able to find is that open windows or closed windows actually does not seem to make much of a difference at all as to whether they're up because houses are not uh, airtight as they are. And usually pressure drops are they're gradual as storms approach and whatnot. So at least it's what I've been able to find over the years um, regarding hurricanes and whatnot. And certainly uh, above ground shelters, it's interesting because a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I did a cross country drip on um, 
Route 66, and we happen to drive right through this area where this thunderstorm is right now, uh, this tornado worn cell. In fact, Elk City is where the National Route 66 Museum is. We were just there a few weeks ago. Um, a lot of places we passed, and even my wife commented, is how uh, they're just all the storm shelters are now above ground because of what you said. You know, you can't, there are a lot of places even around here, you can't go far underground before you start getting to the water table and have be a problem. So, um, and even true to Joe's point earlier about his comments about storm shelters, I can totally see the advantage and the draw to want to get people above ground as long as you have enough, you know, of a buffer around yourself. Uh, certainly walls or as many walls as you can or just a, a safe room or structure uh, around yourself if something like this would happen to, uh, to hit. Larry, also Texas A&M uh, did a damage survey at the request of National Weather Service and they noticed you might have two or three homes and one got destroyed by a tornado and one barely had any damage. And often the homes that survived have the equivalent of hurricane clips. The builders basically use clips and nails. And what happens in Oklahoma, if the roof gets lifted, then the house would just collapse. So using the same building techniques to minimize damage from a hurricane actually works for a tornado. Right, well, good. As I said, that was something that was maybe some kind of a myth also, but that seemed to be the popular view at the time growing yeah. up many, right right many, many years ago so that, mm -hmm. well anyway very very interesting travis thank you you're welcome welcome uh, travis let me uh do, we'll see if there's anybody else that has a question just use the whole on the reactions button just hit the hold up your hand thing and i'll and i'll get you but but uh failing that uh What's the best way to sort of keep uh, informed about uh, about potentially dangerous weather in this area, other than just keeping your TV tuned to nineteen dash two all the time? <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest, and it sounds quite primitive, but in my opinion, the absolute best way is still a twenty five thirty dollar NOAA weather radio. Um, there's a company out there called Midlands. Um, Bruce Midland. He always appears at my weather conferences. Uh, I know that he works in conjunction with TV stations in the Southeast and in the Plains where, you know, they have, you know, they, you can go, go meet your favorite talent and get a weather radio at the, you know, the Kroger down the street. Uh, but that really is the best way to do it. I mean, I know there are apps and there's TV and there's radio, but no weather radio, especially with us, the, uh, the tower for no weather radio is up on Fan Mountain by the observatory. And I think it's a hundred watt signal and has really, really great coverage of the entire area. So first and foremost, I mean, I still have a NOAA weather radio. It's about 30 years old, but it still works. And but even the, our cheap $12 Balfong HTs pick up yeah. NOAA weather radio. And that's what I was going to say too. I mean, all my old Radio Shack scanners I have, I've got a Yezu FT60D, I've got a ICOM V82. I mean, they still have the weather alert mode that when the tones are activated and you have it set on that mode, I mean, it'll go off. So, you know, granted it'll be for- that's the, that's the thing that's nice about the, the, the ones, like the ones you were talking about that actually are, are triggered. They'll turn themselves on when they mm -hmm. need to, as compared to, Balfangs will let you listen to the NOAA radio, but they won't turn on and tell you anyway. The last uh, last tornado alert, we also had uh, code red and installed on my phone. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that something was up when the NOAA weather radio cut loose and my cell phone cut loose and my tablet cut loose. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was like, man, head for the basement. <laughs> no kidding. Um, yeah, I've actually got several redundant ways here as a emergency manager. Uh, I, you know, I use INWS, which push, I can set up push alerts to go to my phone. I also have, um, trying to find the app here. And this is an unofficial endorsement, by the way, um, an unsolicited, um, where is it? Looking, not, the looking. not the TV 29 app. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will be very honest and I'll happily go on the record by saying that Yes, at the end of the day, I'm in television and it's a business and I want everyone to watch, but I almost don't care. Like if there's bad, like if there's tornado warnings, 
just get information from someone, just keep yourself safe. I mean, obviously TV signals are different in parts of the area. And, uh, you know, our signal comes in great. In some parts of Central Virginia, others not so much. But at the end of the day, it's like, hey, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter who you watch. Just get information so you can keep yourself safe. You know, I, I don't, there, there's a line with competition and business. And sometimes you just got to, you know, put that aside for the greater good of everything. And that's just how I feel. Uh, we've got uh, one more question from uh, Joe KO8V, and then and then we'll let you go. But th thank you very much for the time on a working evening. You're welcome. I'm so glad to be part of it. Yeah, go but, ahead, uh, Joe. But Joe, all yours. Thank you. Um, and I realize that you may not be the right person to ask this, but I don't know anybody here in the National Weather Service uh, that works in this area or that's this area. But it's kind of a curiosity to me coming from Texas we would have storm spotter activations frequently, especially spring and fall mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, thunderstorms coming through here. But I don't see that in this area. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of anything of a storm spotter activation. I usually don't, e I don't think I see them in the um, discussions that come up whether storm spotter activation is going to be expected or not. And I was just wondering if you had any insight as to why that might be for, for this section of the country. That's a good question, and I don't know. Um, I know that the National Weather Service office in Sterling has its own dedicated ham station. Uh, they activate, I think, the 147.3 repeater up in Bluefield. I believe that they're very active. Um, as far as other ones in Virginia, I don't know how active they are. And as far as locally, I couldn't tell you either. I know that the National Weather Service will issue what's called hazardous weather outlooks. And those are the content where they'll say, you know, day one tonight. Like, for example, the latest one that I'm reading right now says day one tonight. Areas of dense fog are possible late tonight. Days two through seven, Wednesday through Monday. Areas of dense fog possible early Wednesday morning. Spotter information statement, spotter activation not expected at this time. So the National Weather Service does offer guidance like that. And I believe the hazardous weather outlooks are relayed on the, uh, the cycling National Weather Service feed. But as far as uh, why it's not done locally, I couldn't tell you. I belong to Weather Watch up here in Fairfax. And uh, my number is 707 from the Weather Bureau. Yeah. I've had that for years. And, you know, report any uh, extreme weather to the weather at Sterling. Yeah, they, 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 they do do sky worn training from time to time, which is, a, 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 I think, maybe sort of the equivalent of, of a weather spotter uh, in the sense that you rep call in reports of hail and strong winds and, and uh, and uh, use a web form for reporting on things that are maybe less critical, like snow and things like that. But well, anyway, sure. let's uh, let's have a huge just... round of applause for uh, for yeah. Travis, and we'll let him uh, let him save all of his. Part best of the reason is we don't have a weather service forecast office, really in Central Virginia, and I know that's the reason I was given when I inquired about the lack of an active spotter network. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're right at the edge. If you go one county south of us, that's served by Blacksburg. Albemarle is served by Sterling. Yep. And Fluvanna and Louisa County are served by Wakefield. So I have three different weather forecast offices just covering the nine counties in my viewing area. So trying to get them all on board every once in a while is a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's why we got you. Thanks a lot, Travis, and uh, and I will uh, stop the recording here. But uh, excellent. Thank you all very much for having me. I